Yay. All right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about the early days of id software. Um, and uh, later on, I'm going to be doing um, playing deathmatch. Uh, I think it's going to be at noon until about 1. And, uh, and we have a bunch of uh, Doom posters and Maestro's Del Doom book uh, out there if you're interested after the talk. Um, all right, so welcome, everybody. I'm John Romero, co-founder of id Software. And I'm going to take you on a journey back to the beginning of id Software. Are you guys ready to be entertained? Yeah. All right, you sound like it. <laughs> I do realize that uh, some of what I'm about to say may sound insane, but we were in our 20s when we started id Software, and we didn't think that there were any limits. So I grew up in a really great small town in Northern California named Rockland, and the population was 6,000 people. In the 1970s, I was massively addicted to spending loads of time in dark arcades and playing all the games in there. I got really good at them. In 1979, before anybody had a computer at home, including me, I went to the local college when I was 11 years old. And I started to learn basic from the college students who were actually going to the university. I just walked up to them, and I started asking them what they were writing on the computers. And uh, I started writing those words down. and. Um, started experimenting them on another terminal. Uh, and this was on a, a huge mainframe in the next room. So uh, basically, to keep me at home, my parents got an Apple II Plus computer, and then I was done going outside. I spent all my time programming games on the Apple II Plus. So a few years, and about 20 uh, Apple II games later, I finally learned 6502 assembly language which was the language that all the fast arcade games were written in. So then I could really make awesome arcade, you know, 80s arcade games like this. Well, not quite, <clears throat> but home, arcade, home computer games, which were on the Apple II. And let's just say the Apple II is my personal home arcade, as well as one million other Apple owners at the time. So when I was a sophomore in high school, I did some programming for the Air Force when I was 15 years old. We lived in England then, and my stepfather worked for the Air Force. So in order to get into a high school basic programming class, I showed the teacher that I could actually program in 6502 assembly language. And the next day, I ended up at the aggressor squadron. Uh, I was literally coding in a bank vault. Because I was a kid, they had to give me fake data to use with the code that I was writing. I can't tell you what I was programming. That's classified. Anyway, it's an odd but true story. After high school, I kept on making games, and by 1987, I was working at my favorite game company, Origin Systems. My first job was uh, porting uh, a game called, an RPG called 2400 AD from the Apple II to the Commodore 64 computer. And by this time, I'd made 74 games and had three uh, startup game companies. Capital Idea Software, Inside Out Software, where I ported Might and Magic 2 from the Apple II to the Commodore 64, and a company called Ideas from the Deep, and I was 21 years old. So I went to, a co to work at a company called Softdisk in 1989. I learned how to program a DOS PC there, and at, the, at that point, I was making a small game or a utility every month that had to ship at the end of the month for an entire year. And then, I got tired of doing that, and I basically started a, a game product called Gamer's Edge at Softdisk, and I had to hire a team of game developers. So I hired John Carmack, and then I hired Adrian Carmack, and they're not related. I uh, hired him into my department for programming and art, and Tom Hall came in at night to help, out, to help us out since he was already at Softdisk and he loved making games. So this was the very first time that any of us had worked with another person on a game after we had been making games alone for 10 years each, and it was really incredible. While creating our first game together, which was called Slordax, 
John Carmack discovered the smooth scrolling trick on the PC. Tom Hall and John stayed up until 5 a.m. this one night making a demo that was called Dangerous Dave in Copyright Infringement. And the next day, they put a disc on my, on my keyboard. I saw this disc and uh, put it in. I ran the demo. I watched the screen scroll smoothly, pixel by pixel, and it was a massive eureka moment for me. It was like a bolt of lightning, and I'll elaborate on it, uh, on why in a moment. But id Software was born that instant on September 20th of 1990. So one thing led to another, and we spent a week putting together a demo of Super Mario 3 for Nintendo, which they really liked, but they decided not to publish it because they decided that they needed to keep their intellectual property on their own hardware, which was a pretty smart move. So no problem. We just used that tech for a different game, which we called the Commander Keen Trilogy. So why would a side-scrolling game be such a huge hit in 1990? Well, it was because no games on the PC could, smooth, could scroll horizontally smoothly per pixel. The PC had been available since August of 1981, but in nine years, nobody had figured out how to make the screen scroll perfectly smooth per pixel until this Dangerous Dave and Copyright Infringement demo, which led to Commander Keen. So um, the game on the bottom left there is called Duke Nukem, and uh, that game scrolled by chunks of eight pixels at a time, which was totally like every other game at the, uh, back then. So uh, Commander Keen was the very first game to do this smooth scrolling. So Commander Keen provided uh, this whole trilogy that we made, provided the start of id Software, and we made these three games in three months from September 20th to December 14th when we launched it in 1990. So it was a massive hit for us. It was so popular that people cosplayed as Commander Keen for years at events, and they still do. So the, this game also pioneered the creation of game engines. We designed the game as, uh, as a code engine that operated on different data so we could make different games. So it was the only way that we could actually get this trilogy done really quickly. In fact, in 1991, when we were working on Commander Keen 4, we started licensing that engine for the very first time, 1991. So it was the beginning of the modern engine licensing business. So development on our games went very smoothly and really quickly because we stuck to some core principles that are important even today. So through this talk, I'm going to highlight our core principles, and I'd like to highlight something else right now, namely this photo. Has anyone seen this photo before? Probably not. <laughs> well, it's a picture of us at the lake house in Shreveport, Louisiana in 1990. So the funny thing is people have asked me for years what was in this picture, so I analyzed it recently, and this is what's in it. So this is uh, me and John Carmack in early September of 1990. We were working on the Super Mario 3 demo that we planned on sending to Nintendo. We both worked on this huge Dungeons & Dragons table. So we used to play D&D on weekends, and those D&D sessions led to the ideas for our future games, Doom and Quake. So Tom Hall took the photo, and uh, the computers that we brought home from work, uh, these were the computers that we brought home from work on the weekend. So this was a Saturday or a Sunday. And on top of the monitor, there is one of these old Intel reflective astronaut plushies. And to my left is a notepad that has a task list of bugs to fix. And the whiteboard was our high-level task list of what had to get done to finish the demo. And over on the right-hand side, this is Tom Hall's area, where he was doing all the graphics for the demo. So he recorded Super Mario 3 playing on a Nintendo. He recorded it on VHS, and then he played it back on a VCR, and he paused it so he could copy every tile pixel by pixel. Uh, and he did that in Deluxe Paint 2, which was the Photoshop of the 90s. The TV set that he was looking at it on uh, had a 13-channel selector on it, and it was connected by an RF modulator, so it was super old school. 
Uh, id Software was formally founded on February 1st of 1991. And during that year, we made 12 games. We made Shadow Knights, Dangerous Haven, Haunted Mansion, etc. Rescue Rover 1 and 2. Um, we actually took two months to make each of the games, but we made two games simultaneously. And this is basically due to having 10 years of intense game development prior. But it was also due to our first principle. No prototypes. We just made the games. Uh, just polish as you go. Don't depend on polish happening later. Always maintain constantly shippable code. This is how we made so many games so quickly. We actually knew the entire game design in our heads. We just needed to quantify what had to get done, and we went about working on it until the game was finished. There were no prototypes for our games. We just made them. Remember that we had a small team of four people, and we could actually do this, but with large teams, you obviously have to do a lot of planning. So a quick story. Um, one day it rained really hard, and uh, the lake behind the house in Louisiana was flooding everywhere. So I had to get to work. And we're furiously working away on our games, had to get back in. Um, just got showered, drove down the street, and then I saw this. The entire road was flooded. Well, I got out of the car and I waded through uh, this, this uh, river, well, the, the lake <laughs> flood, and uh, dodging water snakes the entire way and got to the house, took another shower, and then I could actually get back to working. So we were all so excited to be making our own games 24-7, not working for some other company. Um, note that during this year that we made these 12 games, we also moved id Software from Louisiana to Wisconsin, and that takes a lot of time out of game development, but we couldn't afford to have anything go wrong while we are making our games that quickly. So we created another principle that kept us developing fast. Um, it's incredibly important that your game can always be run by your team. So bolt, bolt proof your game by providing defaults on load failure. So if you have 100 people trying to develop a game that won't run, you're paying for 100 people just to sit around waiting for someone to fix it. So we recognize that the importance of keeping the game always playable. And we decided to bolt proof our engine by making all the input solid. So game engines typically fail because they're trying to load bad, cor corrupted, or non-existent data. So checking for this and providing a default uh, for a failure case will keep the game running and quickly show you that something is missing. So if you fail to load a sprite, just show a bagel. So if the theme song isn't loading, play some obviously wrong song for the game. And if you have a missing sound effect, play a horrible sound effect. It'll get replaced quickly. So after 1991, id Software's first stage of company development was complete, and another important principle was in effect. So keep your code absolutely simple. Keep looking at your functions. Figure out what you can simplify further. We wrote all of our games, in, including up to Quake, in basic C, not C++. So stage two, we we're about to begin. In August of 1991, still 1991, uh, we decided to move to Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Tom Hall and I flew up there. We visited. We found it to be really nice in August. Uh, Tom used to live there when he was in college. So we, all four of us moved up there. We continued working on our games. And four months later, we were found dead in the snow, victims of uh, Wisconsin's brutal winters that we did not research. So the moral of the story, do your research. We knew how to program an assembly language, but not how to ask Tom Hall, hey, what are winters like up here? So after six months, that was enough. We moved to Texas. <laughs> um, so we had a new principle. Great tools help make great games. Spend as much time on tools as possible. I wrote a tile editor back in 1991, at the very beginning of 91, named Ted for tile editor. Ted was used for 33 shipped retail games. Several of those games were 3D games, like Hover Tank, Catacomb 3D, Wolfenstein 3D, Spear of Destiny, Rise of the Triad, Corridor 7, and others. So it's January 1992. We decided to go all 3D based on Catacomb 3D's promise. Catacomb 3D looked pretty cool, just didn't play very cool. 
So Wolfenstein 3D is our next game. It took four months of development to make Wolfenstein and get it to its shareware launch. That's with one episode of levels. It took two more months to finish all six episodes and a hint book that went along with it. First month of Wolfenstein, with no advertising, it sold 4,000 copies that were $60 each. Spear of Destiny came right after that. Uh, it took us two months to make Spear of Destiny. It was a prequel to Wolfenstein 3D, and it was retail only. So soon after that, Tom Hall traveled to Kentucky from Texas to work for just a couple months on Wolfenstein VR. Yes, this was 1992 VR. Back in the days of Commander Keen, I had discovered a small three-person game company. They were called Raven Software in Madison, Wisconsin. I found out about them. I called them up. I went over with everybody. We introduced ourselves. And flash forward seven months later, we did a little bit of work with them by modifying the Wolfenstein 3D engine, and we licensed it to them for a game called Shadowcaster. So Shadowcaster's tech improvements were sloping floors, lighting, and fog. This engine looked slightly better than Wolfenstein 3D, but it wasn't good enough for our next game. So John Carmack spent some months thinking about how more advanced that this new engine needed to be for this game that we decided to call Doom. Based on the rapid development of our previous games, we came up with another important principle. We are our own best testing team. We should never allow anyone else to experience bugs or see the game crash. Don't waste others' time. Test thoroughly before checking in your code. No throwing it over the fence for testers to find, put in a bug report, fix it later. It's a wasteful cycle. We had no QA at id Software. So after 1992, id Software's second stage of company development was complete along with another core principle. As soon as you see a bug, you fix it. You do not continue on. We didn't have QA. We are QA. If you don't fix your bugs, your new code is going to be built on a buggy code base to ensure an unstable foundation. If you check in buggy code, someone's going to be writing code on top of that code, and it's going to, you can just imagine how bad that's going to be. So the ideas for Doom came from our D&D campaign, which was full of demons. We also loved the, the movies Evil Dead and Aliens. Doom's design was a mashup of ideas. At the beginning of Doom's development, we created a new core principle. Use a development system that is superior to your target to develop your game. So before Doom, we were making games for DOS while we were developing on DOS computers. So we knew that we could do better if we used more powerful computers and a more advanced operating system to develop our games. So we developed Doom using Next Step workstations. They were far superior to DOS. Next Step eventually turned into OS X. This also meant that one of our core principles was upheld, which was great tools help make great games. We could make far better tools on Next Step. So DoomEd and QuakeEd were two of the most important tools that we had. They both really helped us uh, create levels and test them very quickly. So you might not have known this, but we had five people on our team creating Doom. This was right after Wolfenstein, this picture. Uh, after Tom Hall left, we hired Sandy Peterson and Dave Taylor, which brought us up to six people total. So unbelievably, while we were making Doom, we had to stop all production on the game, and we had to create the Super Nintendo port of Wolfenstein 3D as fast as possible. We had promised a Japanese company about nine months earlier that we would do this port for them, and we hired someone else to do it, and they didn't come through, so we had to finish it ourselves. So we were starting, uh, because we were starting from never having programmed a Super Nintendo before, it took us three weeks to make this port, because we had to learn the hardware. Then we jumped back to making Doom again. So we uploaded the shareware version of Doom to the University of Wisconsin server on December 10th of 1993. The excitement for the game was unprecedented. People were creating files in the upload directory that were sentences like, 
when.will.we.c.doom. We got random phone calls in the office asking when it would be out. So time for another quick story. During the final day of Doom's creation, we worked 30 hours. We had the game running on all the computers in the office to ensure that it was really solid. However, on a couple computers, the game froze up. The menu could be popped up and put away, but the gameplay just stopped. So John Carmack thought about what could possibly be happening, and he figured out the solution, and without doing any debugging, he just fixed it, and he was correct in his solution, and we finally uploaded the game after just a five-minute fix and a bunch of testing. At the beginning of 1994, I started working with Raven Software and developed Heretic using the Doom engine. I wanted to see how an inventory system in a medieval version of Doom would play, and it turned out pretty great. Does anyone here remember Heretic? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> we also made Doom 2 in 1994, over eight months. It was released on September 30th in the U.S. and October 10th in the rest of the world. In addition to this, we did the Jaguar Doom port on ourselves. Again, we were multitasking and making multiple games. So we made two games in 1993, three games in 1994. In 1995, we started working on Quake. We had nine developers. We had four designers, three coders, two artists, and I was the only one to do both coding and design. I wrote QuakeEd and experimented with level design in full 3D. Again, we started with a clean code base. There was no code from Doom used in Quake, which was another one of our principles in development. <laughs> Write your code for this game only, not for a future game. You're going to be writing new code later because you'll also be smarter and you're not tying yourself down to the limitations of your past code. Get used to inventing new things. So Quick's engine was being developed by John Carmack and the rasterization was being done by Michael Abrash. John Cash worked on the network code. He went on to become the lead programmer of World of Warcraft. Another quick story. So this relates back to our belief that developing in a superior operating system will result in a better game. So while we were making Quake, we made a deal with Cray Supercomputers to buy a Cray 6400 super server for half price. Our plan was to have our development team connected to it so we could BSP and light our maps as well as crunch whatever new kinds of data we would create with our next game engine. We didn't know what that would be. So the computer room in Quake's DM3 level was going to be full of Cray computers as a reference to this new hardware that we were going to acquire. Unfortunately, Cray was bought by Silicon Graphics before Quake was done, and the deal fell apart. So the computer room in Quake is filled with the usual rectangular mainframes instead of C-shaped Cray machines. After publishing Heretic, I started working with Raven on Hexen. I wanted to see uh, how an FPS would play with a hub level system and character classes. Hexen launched on October 30th, 1995 during the Deathmatch 95 event that was happening at Microsoft in Washington. Does anyone remember Hexen? Okay, good. <laughs> a month later, I got Raven started on my next design, which was called Hecatome. It would be the third game in the series with Heretic, Hexen, and Hecatome. Hecatome was never finished, however. It was turned into Hexen 2. It just wasn't the same game design. During this time, we noticed a small game company making some pretty cool games like Raptor Call of the Shadows, and we brought them down from Illinois to make a game that we would publish. They called themselves Rogue, Rogue Entertainment, and about 14 months later, released Strife, which used the Doom engine. It was an FPS RPG. It was really fun. Back in 1996, it showed that combining games, the game genres, uh, could actually make a fun FPS. So nowadays, we have Destiny and other FPS RPGs, but Strife was the first one. Also during 1995, we made the Ultimate Doom, which was a retail version of the registered version of the original Doom with an extra episode. And we also made the master levels of Doom. 
Yet Software was still nine developers in size. We released two games in 1995 while we were working on Quake. So work continued on Quake, and 14 months after we started, we released Q-Test on February 24th, 1996, for the world to test our internet gameplay. During the next four months, we worked really hard to complete Quake. We also released Final Doom by Team TNT and the Casali brothers. And we released Death Kings of the Dark Citadel, an additional set of levels for Hexen. One important principle that helped us get Quake done faster was this. Encapsulate functionality to ensure design consistency. So examples of this in Quake would be the torches on the wall. We could have made the level designers place a torch model, then a fire model that animated, then a torch sound entity, all at the same location. But then if we needed to move a lot of stuff, something could have gotten left behind. So it's far easier to just create a torch entity that had all the functionality built into it already. Also, water in the game needed sound effect entities all over the place to fully cover all the water areas so you would actually hear it everywhere. Well, if the water got modified in the level, moving all those entities around and deleting some would have been a big mess. So it was easier to make the game just play water audio whenever water was being rendered on the screen. So we made a renderer level feature and took it out of the designer's hands. It ensured consistency and it saved a lot of memory. And we did this same, this, this same functionality for the sky audio in Quake. So I released Quake Shareware on June 22nd at 5.30 Texas time on the University of Wisconsin at Madison site, as usual. Uh, time for another quick story. While I'm Michael Abrash was programming the renderer, he was interleaving CP, uh, Intel CPU instructions with FPU instructions to calculate perspective correct texture mapping. So sometimes while he was playing the game, for one frame, the game would show a completely different part of the map. So he isolated the only instruction where that could possibly happen. He determined that it was impossible for it to be this invalid value that caused it. So he had a friend from Intel come over to id and go through his analysis. And his friend agreed with him. Yep, that's correct. Uh, told him that there was a known error with the floating point divide instruction on the Pentium. So it was a hardware error. It was an overclocked Pentium. So there was nothing that we could do about it, so we just left it alone. And this bug is known as the Pentium FDiv bug. So Quake is the game that introduced the world to mouse look, uh, a high-speed, true 3D world, and internet multiplayer. So clans sprung up immediately, as did esports and tournaments everywhere. So Quake World was launched five months later. So making games was and still is our life. We love it more than anything else, as you can tell by our release of 28 games in five and a half years by less than 10 people. Many other games were released that used our license technology over the years. And here are some more core principles that we learned from all this work. Try to code transparently. Tell your lead and your peers exactly how you're going to solve your current task and get feedback and advice. Don't treat game programming like each coder is a black box. The project could go off the rails and cause delays. Programming is a creative art form based in logic. Every programmer is different and will code differently. Don't waste time focusing on a rigid coding style. It's the output that matters. Thank you very much. Hope you liked it. So I think uh, we might have time for questions, possibly. There are any questions? We have a microphone. Roving microphone. Yeah. Might take a minute. When, when you work with the Super Nintendo, uh, how did you, did you test? The Nintendo gave you a special kind of hardware or, or just a standard console? Yeah, we had a Nintendo development system from Nintendo. Okay. So I had to become a licensed developer. Um, and then you get the hardware from Nintendo, and then you basically use it to, to program it. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, nowadays if you become a, if you're gonna program the switch nowadays, you get a special switch um, to connect your PC. Okay, one moment. Exercise. <laughs> I think John, it was a really interesting talk. I wanted to ask, um, how, how did you feel with the success of Doom? Like, was that something that you guys knew could happen? Um, or you were like super surprised and didn't expect anything of that? And I also have a second question, where are you playing these days? <laughs> I love getting that question. Because <laughs> the answer is, is kind of funny. Um, by the t you know, when we made Commander Keen, it was really big. We did Commander Keen, uh, the second trilogy, and that was also big. The engine was way more advanced than the first one. Then we did uh, Wolfenstein, which was crazy, like massively successful. It was the first time we started getting interv interviews. Um, and we knew that Doom was gonna be huge, and we knew that before we even started working on the game. So because we knew what we were going to make when we started on Doom in January of 1993, when we started making it, started programming, we put a press release out that basically said, we're making the best game in the world and prepare for a drop in productivity worldwide. <laughs> and you can actually find this press release online. If you just Google, you'll find like, you know, Doom 1993 press release. Um, you can see all of the like, bullet points and everything we said that we were going to do, which is multiplayer, it's going to be moddable, it's going to be an open game. Um, all, all the stuff that we are going to do, we knew we were going to do it. And like, don't ever do that. Don't ever put out a press release saying you're going to make the best thing ever. <laughs> but we did it. Um, and nowadays, uh, I play everything. Uh, my latest one is Hitman 2 because it just came out recently. And I love the Hitman series. Uh, but I play games on on mostly PC and mobile, so I'm not a big uh, not a big console player, except for the Switch. <laughs> we have time for the last question. Okay. Okay. So, what do you think of Grant's? What do I think of grants? Crunch. So oh, crunch time. Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Um, so yeah, so I have a kind of a philosophy about crunch time. Uh, if I'm working on something that I really love, it does not feel like crunch time, no matter how much time I spend on it. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're working hours that you don't want to work, um, then I think that you're, you, it's definitely crunch for you because somebody's making you do something that you don't want to do. Um, if you, you know, even, even, I mean, there are times when you're working on a game and you really love it and you want to work on it, but you can't because you're just too tired, then you just, don't, you just don't work on it. But if you're being made to work on it, that's absolutely crunch time. At Ed Software, we never had crunch because we loved what we were doing. In, in 1991, when we made 12 games, uh, we we didn't really go outside except to go sometimes get food. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was 10 in the morning until at least midnight or 2 in the morning, and that's basically almost seven days a week. And uh, we just loved it. We were we were we were practicing. It's like a band that's practicing over and over, you know, for a solid year making stuff. And uh, and it was awesome. Like we loved the fact that we were making these new things, and every every game was different than the previous game, and it was super exciting. And we didn't want to stop, so we didn't. And uh, except for we played D and D, and we played uh, Super Nintendo games and stuff. But it was all like this game cocoon, basically, and and we loved it. Uh, so we wouldn't call that crunch, even though other people would say that was like the worst crunch in the world. So it's so really, it's up to your de definition, but mine is, if you're doing stuff that you don't want to do, then it's crunch. Okay, don't miss the match, uh, room five, ten past twelve, and thanks, John. That's right, death match. Thanks. <laughs>